say welcome to everyone in Overflow. So glad that you are here with us today. Maybe you're watching in one of the lobby areas. Glad that you're here. And if you are tuned in online, uh, thankful you're joining us that way. And McAllen Campus, let's give a special welcome to all the Alice folks watching online. <laughs> glad that you guys are tuned in. And uh, I can't tell you how excited I am and how much I look forward to the day uh, that we have the Alice Campus up and running. And uh, until then, so thankful that you're uh, catching us online. Uh, one of the homes there in Alice. I say this again, welcome BT Edinburgh. All right. It is an uh, exciting day for us uh, as we're officially one church in three locations working on that fourth one with Alice, Lord willing, by the end of the summer, that one will be up and running. It's the uh, beginning of summer, so kids are out of school, graduates are graduating, there's one kid excited, and so, and no parents excited. So, <laughs> uh, graduations are taking place, all kinds of exciting things. Here at BT, we have wrapped up our journey through the Sermon on the Mount, Kingdom Come, nine months on the longest recorded teaching of Jesus in Scripture. We started the first Sunday of September, we wrapped it up last Sunday, and today we start a new series together, a new journey, I like the word journey, it's not quite nine months long. This one's five weeks, and five weeks looking at the life of the prophet Elijah in the book of 1 Kings. So if you have your Bible, why don't you grab it and open to 1 Kings chapter 17. While you do that, uh, as I said, we have the BT uh, Edinburgh family with us, so thankful to have them together uh, here in this service. They'll be with us next week as well uh, in one of the services, Saturday 6, Sunday 9, 11, or 11 in Sherryland, Edinburgh folks, anyone you want to go to. And then the following Sunday, uh, June 17th, uh, BT officially sends out the people of BT Edinburgh to take the city by storm for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So uh, what I want to do is I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Mike Govan and his wife Linda to come join me up here. Y'all welcome Mike and Linda. And you may, some of you uh, long-term BT folks, you may think that name sounds familiar or, or that couple looks familiar. It's because for 10 years, B.T. McAllen was the Govan's home. Their kids were baptized in this baptistry uh, right here. Uh, Mike served our men's ministry. He helped me in the student ministry for many years. And so it's so amazing to me, God's faithfulness, that, that not only is he letting us as B.T. Church move into Edinburgh to see the gospel go forward, but he's letting us join arms with an amazing church uh, in Edinburgh Gospel Church and amazing friends and family. Uh, that, that we've known for a long time. And so, uh, Mike, I don't know if there's anything you want to say. I preach a long time, so don't say too much. But uh, I don't know if there's anything you want to say uh, to both the family you've known and then the new family that's grown. Well, I can tell you that uh, to, if I look out across this beautiful sanctuary, I'm, I've, I've been having flashbacks all morning long of all the things God has done in my heart in this very room. And to come back and be able to allow it to be uh, linking arms with uh, Chris, longtime friend and ton of respect for this man, uh, B.T. McAllen, you have a phenomenal lead pastor, let me tell you that. I'm sure you know that. You have a phenomenal pastoral staff. And to be, a, to be allowed to join these men and to have them hold me accountable for the glory of God and for souls to get saved in the valley, I couldn't ask for anything more than that. Amen. Well, we want to, um, now you, you know how it works. If you're going to clap, you got to do it. None of this half stuff. we got to keep going. We've got time for the half clap. All right. Well, well, in light of what today means for us as a church coming together as one, we want to pray over uh, Mike and Linda, but over BT Edinburgh all together. And so, uh, listen, here's the instructions. Uh, you can point a hand this way, point an arm this way, symbolically uh, laying hands on Mike and Linda, but we have BT Edinburgh right in this area. Raise your hand, BT Edinburgh. And so you can... You can Extend an arm that way. I know this is crazy. You don't do it in church if you want to get up and move and lay hands on some of those folks. But, but uh, B.T. McAllen, let's extend our arms. Let's gather around and let's lift up um, today B.T. Edinburgh for the glory of God and for the transformation of souls across the valley. Would you join me as we pray? Father, today I'm so thankful for what this day represents uh, in the kingdom uh, and in, in the kingdom of God in the valley and what it means to the local body of BT. Father, I'm thankful for Mike and Linda for their marriage, for the fact that you've called them to yourself by grace to salvation. You saved their kids, Father. And God, you've called Mike to ministry. And God, I'm thankful for his faithfulness in student ministry at BT and men's ministry um, at, at, at Logos and McAllen and, and planting Edinburgh Gospel Church as well, Father. And God, I'm thankful for uh, his willingness to lock arms with us at BT. God, I'm thankful for the people of Edinburgh Gospel Church. 
uh, for the legacy of faith that happened, for the lives that were transformed. And God, as we come together today under one banner in the kingdom, and Father, under the vision to be BT Church across the valley, across Texas, across the world, God, we pray that you would um, give just a heightened sense of passion for the folks in Edinburgh. God, we, we, we give you thanks right now for the lives that are going to be transformed through this ministry, for those that will be saved, through those that will be obedient to baptism, for marriages that will be restored, for people who will be freed from addiction, for your glory, God. God, God, continue to bring us together as one body, Father. Let us enjoy the blessing of, of being a family in many places, Father. And I pray today your richest favor and blessing over the folks of BT Edinburgh, over Mike and Linda, God, and I pray that you would use them and pour them out for your glory alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. So we are in this new series on the life of Elijah, and it's called Droughts, Doubts, and Destiny. And here's the thing. All of us in this life have faced droughts. Now, there are some people in this room. Uh, you, you, you've got the Flowers and the Jones family. You've got some people in agriculture, and they, they understand droughts a little differently than some of us. But, but I don't just mean a lack of rain. See, all of us, if we're honest, we face droughts in life. We've, we face spiritual droughts where we, were, we, were, we just wondered if God was there. And I'm talking to the believers in the room. We, we wondered if he was there. And God, are you listening? And, and we just felt spiritually dry. We faced emotional droughts and droughts in our marriages and, and droughts mentally. And a lot of times, the droughts we face in life, they create doubts, Right? I know we're not supposed to say it in church, but as believers, sometimes we have doubts, what I just said. Are you there? Are you listening? What's going on? Why is this happening? And what Satan loves about droughts and doubts is that if we focus on them, we forget our destiny. Now, here's the deal. Destiny has kind of become a unique word in church. There's some TV preachers that have taken the word destiny, and they've, they've created it to mean some nonsense, that if you have enough faith, you'll always have money and always have health, and bad things won't happen. Well, that's not biblical. But destiny is biblical. See, we, we, don't, we don't need to let that word get hijacked. We can bring it back. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome, and he told them that you have been predestined, as in there's a destiny set for them in Christ. And beloved, if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you do have a destiny, and it's to be found in him and to look like him and to bring glory to him, and it's the greatest destiny there is. And we will live in this broken world until he calls us home, and when he calls us home, we will be free of all the things all the things that cause us to not see him clearly. And that's our ultimate destiny. But here's the reality. People who don't know Jesus have a destiny also right now. We just talked about it in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. If you don't know Jesus, you currently have a destiny to be separated from God for eternity in hell. But the good news is it doesn't have to be that way. And so droughts, doubts, and destiny. What I love about the life of the prophet Elijah is over the next five weeks, we're going to see a lot of high moments in his life, right? And they're inspiring. You know, one of the things that I really love about the life of Elijah is not just that there are high moments, right? I mean, sometimes I read the scriptures and I, and I read about the heroes of faith, these men and women in the Bible, and they have these amazing high moments. And I get inspired, but part of me is like, I can never do that. What you're going to find over the next five weeks, beloved, is not just amazing high moments, but desperate low moments in Elijah's life as well. And you know what that means? It means he's just like you and I. He, he's just as hopeless without God and has just as much of a destiny and purpose with God. And so my prayer is over the next five weeks that we will, we will be encouraged even in times of droughts and doubts. And that we will cling to who God has called us to be in Christ for his glory and for his kingdom. Now before I jump into the text, again it's 1 Kings is where you need to be in your Bible. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there may be one under the seat in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible, by the way, I want you to take that Bible home as our gift to you. I want you to have a copy of God's word. But before I go there, I need to do a quick history lesson, okay? And I need to do a recap. I know not everybody likes history, but I'm going to try to fly through some Old Testament history regarding the nation of Israel. Are you ready? That was inspiring. <laughs> Five out of a thousand people. We're ready. All right, so here we go. All right, so maybe, maybe you've heard of a guy named Jacob, right? We, we meet Jacob in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. Now, now Jacob was a good guy. He, he, he trusted God. He, he wrestled with God. He lost, by the way. That's how that works. Uh, but in the process of his faithfulness, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Ding, ding, ding. All right? So he changes his name. 
Now, Israel, right, Jacob, Israel, same guy, he's got a whole mess of kids. I mean, he's got a litter. He's got, he got 12 sons, okay? And his 12 sons, they have kids. And those kids have kids, and you, you see how it goes, right? So over time, the 12 sons of Israel actually become tribes. Sadly, the nation of Egypt takes the 12 tribes of Israel and makes them slaves. That's when we read about Moses, or you've seen him in the Ten Commandments, or Charlton Heston, or Prince of Egypt, right? Anyways, Moses comes in. Now, by the time Moses takes, comes onto the scene, the 12 tribes of Israel, the descendants of Jacob, are over a million people. that They have, they have repopulated and done a good job, okay? And, and so it has grown. They, they are in slavery. They are led out of slavery and then they take the land that God had promised them, known as the, hey, you're catching on, the promised land, right? So, so check this out. I just covered more or less the first five books of the Bible. Now we're in the book of Joshua. Israel, the nation of Israel, right, originally the 12 tribes, they've taken the land, some 2 million people. They take the land, they're setting things up to have some type of structure and kind of governance for the people. Uh, God tells them, appoint some judges. Now we're in the book of Judges, right? Things are going well. It's great. Uh, Israel had the single best political system you can have. Now I want you to hear me clearly. I, I am thankful to live in this country. I'm thankful for our republic and democracy. But Israel had the best political structure you can have. That's a monarchy with God as king. That's what they had. But what happens is, is Israel calls out to God, and they say, God, we want a king. And God says, well, you got one, me. But then they put on their whiny voice, and they kick their feet, and they say, but God, we want a people king, like with, with flesh and blood and stuff. And God says, you don't need one, but I'll give you one. Be, be warned, beloved, if you continually ask God for things that he knows aren't best for you, sometimes I'll let you have it just to show he's right. So he gives them a king. This guy named Saul, he's tall, dark, and handsome. He looks like a king, just doesn't have the heart of a king, right? So, so Saul becomes king. He's not doing a great job, doesn't have the heart of a king. So then a guy named David, raise your hand if you heard of David. All right, now, yeah, now we're talking, right? Feist the giant, yeah. David becomes king, and things are going well for Israel. He's king for 40 years. He, they conquer lands. They, they, they expand. They're a world power. One nation, right? Israel. David passes on, his son Solomon becomes king, wisest man to ever live. He leads Israel in a time of peace. David was a warring king. It's a time of peace. Things are still going well. Solomon passes away, and his son Rehoboam becomes king. Everybody say Rehoboam. Rehoboam. You know, we've let that name go by the wayside. We need to bring it back, guys. If you are expecting a child, I want to see Rehoboam on the top ten list of boys <laughs> for 2019. So Rehoboam becomes king. And this is when something important happens. You're like, why does this matter? It does. This is what happened that's important. This is what I'm getting at. When Rehoboam becomes king, the kingdom splits. So now remember the 12 tribes? Ten of those tribes, those people groups, those clans, they stay in the north. Becomes the northern kingdom of Israel. Two of those tribes stay in the south. They become the southern kingdom of Judah. This is about 930 B.C. when this happens. Okay, Elijah is called to be a prophet of God to the northern kingdom of Israel when a guy named Ahab is serving as king. He is not the one-legged ship captain from Moby Dick. It's a different Ahab, all right? <laughs> but th this is what you need to know. Following Rehoboam, every king leading up to Ahab was evil. In 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30, what the Bible tells us is that Ahab... Had, he did more evil in the sight of God than all those who came before him. It is not good. You could guess that the nation of Israel is not in a great place spiritually. All these evil kings, false gods have come in. Ahab is married to Jezebel. She brings in the worship of Baal. All this stuff is proliferating over the nation. It's not that they have completely denied the one true God, Yahweh. It's that they've just welcomed in all these other gods. And, you know, Yahweh, I'll, I'll, I'll pray to you, but if you don't listen, I'll pray to Baal or I'll pray to Asherah. I'll find someone to pray to. And so it's in a bad place spiritually. There's idol worship, there's child sacrifice, there's sexual activity in the temple. It is a mess, and God finally says enough is enough, and he raises up, check out, one man to take a stand. And don't miss this. In a time when the nation of Israel had given her affections to all these false gods, God raises up a man named Elijah, which in Hebrew means Yahweh is my God. You catch that? 
God says, you have given your affections and allegiance to other gods. You have worshipped idols. I am going to change things, and I'm going to raise up Yahweh is my God exclusively to do so. So that's what's happening in, in the life of the nation of Israel. Let's take a look here at the text to see the story for today. This is 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to read the whole chapter, so stay with me. This is what the text says. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from the Gilead settlers said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, in whose presence I stand, there will be no dew or rain during these years except by my command. Now, I don't miss this. Elijah tells the king, uh, by the word of the Lord, until I say so, it's not going to rain. Th- th- he just pronounced economic, national, political crisis on Ahab's country. See, as a large, largely agrarian agricultural society, no rain, bad crops, bad crops, bad money. No rain, bad livestock, bad livestock, no food, no food, famine, riots. You see, he, he, he didn't give good news to the king here. And so he goes and he gives this announcement in verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came to him, and leave here, turn eastward, and hide at the Wadi Cherith where it enters the Jordan. Wadi literally is a ravine. It's a dry riverbed, okay? And Cherit in Hebrew means uh, to be cut off. So he says you need to leave here and go to the cut off ravine where it enters the Jordan. You are to drink from the Wadi. I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he proceeded to do what the Lord commanded. Elijah left and lived at the Wadi Cherit where it enters the Jordan. The ravens kept bringing him bread and meat in the morning. Catch that bread and meat for all the vegetarians in the room. And meat. <laughs> but honestly, like... I love you, and it's cool if you're a vegetarian or vegan because it's more meat for me. So anyways, um, (laughs) continuing on, verse 7. After a while, so he's there for a while, the wadi dried up because there was what? No rain. There's a drought, right? No rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, get up and go to Zarephath that belongs to Sidon and stay there. Look, I've commanded a woman who was a widow to provide for you there. So Elijah got up and went to Zarephath. When he arrived at the city gate, there was a widow gathering wood. Elijah called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup and let me drink. And as she went to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I don't have anything baked. Only a handful of flour in the jar and a bit of oil in the jug. Just now I am gathering a couple of sticks in order to prepare it for myself and my son so we can eat it and die. She's a cheery lady there. She's full of good news. But she said, uh, I, I'm, i got to keep going here, uh, verse 13, Then Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid, go and do as you have said, but first make me a small loaf from it and bring it out. I love, you, you catch that? She says, I don't have enough stuff to bake you anything. I'm going to make a small cake and my son are going to eat it and die. And Elijah goes, hey, do what you want, just bake me a cake first, all right? <laughs> go and do as you said, just first. Afterward, you may make some for yourself and your son, for this is what the Lord God of Israel says. The flour jar will not become empty, and the oil jug will not run dry until the day the, the day the Lord sends rain on the surface of the land. So she proceeded to do according to the word of Elijah. Then the woman, Elijah, and her household ate for many days. The flour jar did not become empty, and the oil jug did not run dry according to the word of the Lord he had spoken through Elijah. After this, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill, and his illness got worse until he stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, man of God, why are you here? Have you come to call attention to my iniquity so that my son is put to death? But Elijah said to her, give me your son. So he took him from her arms, brought him up to the upstairs room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow I am staying with by killing her son? And then he stretched himself out over the boy three times. He cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, my God, please let this boy's life come into him again. And so the Lord listened to Elijah, and the boy's life came into him again, and he lived. Then Elijah took the boy, brought him down from the upstairs room into the house, and gave him to his mother. Elijah said, look, your son is alive. And then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God, and the Lord's word from your mouth is true. Let's pray. Father, in these next few moments, would you open our hearts and minds to receive from you, God? Father, I pray for hopeless situations that you would pronounce hope today. God, I pray for broken relationships, for marriages on the brink of disaster, God. I pray for those that are needing a healing touch, Father. I pray that you would 
bring those things. God, I pray above that that you would cause us to trust you regardless of what we see before us. Father, I pray today for those that are gathered here, those that are watching somewhere, that God, if there's someone that has yet to trust Jesus as Savior, that today you would call them by name. You would make them so aware of their need for you. God, I pray you would break them and ruin them if necessary so they would submit and receive the free gift of salvation for your glory and for their good. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so here in the text, we see some interesting things taking place, right? God tells Ahab, go to the king and, and tell him this news. And, and we could read that, and we could think that's like the high point uh, of Elijah's life. I mean, he just got called by God to be a prophet. God says, go to the king. He gets an audience with the king. Then he stands before the most evil of evil kings, and he says, here's the deal, buddy. It ain't going to rain until I say so according to the power and the word of God. Like, that's a huge moment right there. You, you could think that this was the high point of Elijah's life, the apex of his ministry. But, beloved, he, God's just getting started here. This isn't the high point of Elijah's ministry. This is God preparing him for what he has prepared for him. Did you catch that? See, all of chapter 17, I believe, is God preparing Elijah for what he has prepared for Elijah. See, chapter 17 of 1 Kings, I think God does some character building with the prophet Elijah. And let me, let me say it this way. Maybe this makes more sense. See, God had to do some things in Elijah so he could do some things through Elijah. And that's probably true for some of us today. Maybe you feel like God has forgotten you. Maybe you are in the cut-off ravine, right? You feel alone and you feel forgotten. And, beloved, may I just challenge you to think that instead of thinking God has forgotten you, would you think that perhaps he is all around you and over you and he is preparing you uh, for some things on the inside so he can do some things on the outside for his glory? So that's what he's doing with Elijah. And then based on the text, I think there are three stages to Elijah's character building. See, he's in this preparation process. And the truth is, if we're honest, a lot of us, we don't like the process of preparation, right? We're instant gratification people. But God, knowing what he wants to accomplish through Elijah, he has some things to do inside Elijah. And I think there are three stages to his character building. And I think this applies to us. The first stage that we see uh, Elijah experience is isolated pain. Isolated pain. Now, you may think to yourself, I don't see that. All right, well, I, I don't want to you know, say stuff that's not there. Let me, let me look at the text for a second. Isolated pain. In verses 2 and 3, it says this again, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide. Right? Uh, Elijah has just told the evil king that his country is going to face a crisis. And then as he's standing before the man who can take his life, God gives him good advice. He says, Now you should run away. Right? He says, Leave. Like now. And what he said, leave, go eastward, and do what? Hide. Now, I don't know how it works. Sometimes we play hide and go seek at our house. My wife with our four kids, we turn all the lights off, and the kids get real scared, and we laugh because we're bad parents. But anyways. Um, <laughs> but inevitably, when we turn the lights off, we play hide and go seek. Inevitably, the kids group together because they don't want to be alone. Well, guess what? There's no such thing as hiding kids you can't find. They all get together. They start chirping. We find them. God did not tell Elijah, get, get your three closest buddies and head off to the cutoff ravine. No, he said, you go and you go hide. Now, I'm not making this up. This is what he told Elijah to do. And the text says, doesn't say how long, but he says he was there for a while. He says, after many days. He was there for a while. Why? Because God was doing some things in him. God took him to the cutoff ravine. Ravine. How many people you think hang out at the cutoff ravine? You ever feel like you've been at the cutoff ravine in your life? Dead end dreams? Failed marriage? Kids going crazy? Finances a wreck? You just just lost a loved one, a parent, a spouse, a child. I don't. Know. Sometimes we find ourselves in these cutoff ravines. And yes, beloved, because God is sovereign, he's, he allows it, but I will go so far as to say sometimes that's where he actually leads us. Because in times of isolation, and by the way, Elijah was alone. You don't have to be isolated to feel alone. You know, sociologists are studying New York City, one of the most populated cities in the world, the most populated city in, in the United States. 
people can, the, the, the population density is crazy in New York, right? If you've been there, you, you go out, you walk Manhattan. People that live in New York City, New Yorkers, they can walk the streets of Manhattan and literally make eye contact with millions of people a day. Yet sociologists are finding that many times through study and interview, residents of New York City say they feel alone. You don't, you don't have to be alone to feel alone, right? And sometimes we go through, we do, through droughts, and we go through doubts, and I, and I know in a room this size and people watching online, there are a lot of people in, in droughts and doubts. There are single moms trying to figure out how it's going to work. There are people that have recently buried a loved one. There are people that aren't sure how they're going to pay the rent, pay the light bill. There are people without jobs. There are people that feel like God has abandoned them. These are real situations. I'm not going to say they're not real. What I'm going to say is that maybe if you'll let God do some things in these situations, you'll see him then do some things through those situations. He, he took Elijah away so that he would be alone, so that the only thing he had was God. He, he took him to a place and to a point of isolation. Beloved, let me say this. Remember that, 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 that times of pain don't necessarily equal the silence of God. Right? They, they don't always equate those two. And, and, and let me say this also. If you feel you're in the droughts and doubts of life, and I know we're not supposed to talk about it at church, but let me just be transparent. In my life, when I've had doubts, it's not when I've avoided them, but when I've pressed into them many times that I've become keenly aware of the presence of God in my life. It's, it's when I pretend they're not there and I put on the Sunday smile, hey, brother, how you doing? Blessed and highly favored, right? Like little Christian robots. See, when, when we do that, what, we're not sure of anything. But when we get real and we get in community and we have some, you know, it doesn't have to be a thousand people, not the best place to do it, but you have a community group or a small group of friends and you start getting real with some people and you actually press into those doubts. Many times in the pressing into the doubts, the presence of God becomes very aware. And don't think that because maybe you're in a time of isolation, a time of pain, that God isn't planning things for you. God had big things planned for Elijah. We'll see him in the next four weeks. And this is the truth, beloved. If you've trusted Jesus, this, this isn't health and wealth. This is biblical. If you've trusted Jesus, God has great things prepared for you. I didn't say it. Paul said it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For you are his workmanship, his craftsmanship, his masterpiece, created for him to do good works that he prepared for you beforehand, before you were born, before you were thought of. Check this out. If you know Jesus as your Savior, God has thought of things, great things for you to do for his glory. And you may feel isolated, and that's real, and I'm not saying it's not. I felt it. You feel alone, and you feel forgotten, but it does not mean that God has forgotten you, and it does not mean he doesn't have great things in front of you. It might mean he's doing some things in you because of what he's about to do through you. Elijah had some character building through some isolated pain. He also had character building through total dependence on God. Total dependence, right? God tells him, leave here. Go to the cut-off ravine, the Wadi Cherith. Go there. And then verses 4, 5, and 6 say that God tells him, drink from the Wadi. Drink from the brook. Now, I already said this. The wadi is a dry riverbed that holds water when it rains. What did Elijah pronounce? A drought, so there's not any water, there's no rain. But God says, drink, so, so God is providing water in the brook. Elijah can't do it. He can't pull, this is the exact opposite of Elijah pulling himself up by the bootstraps, right? A self-made man. He is a crushed man, dependent on God. Beloved, hear me. God, you know what God does? God, God does impossible tasks in the human realm. He does impossible tasks, and many times he chooses impossible people. And the only way it happens is when the impossible people are totally dependent upon him. That's what he's teaching Elijah. You're going to drink from the brook. I will bring you bread and meat morning and evening by the ravens. God had graciously, this isn't punishment, God had graciously taken Elijah to a place where all he had was God so that he would be, so that he would be reminded that all he needed was God. You know the reality in our society where we, we, can, we can work hard and accomplish and we can, you know, we applaud picking ourselves up by the bootstraps. You know what happens? This, this is what happens to me, not, not you. You're, like, you're good Christians, all right, but you're, you're a sinful pastor. This is what happens. What happens to me 
is I say I depend on God, but many times I don't act like it. I can take care of some things. Now hear me, total dependence on God isn't being responsible. It's that in your acts of responsibility, you are submitting it all to the Lord. An example, when you get sick, I, I encourage you to go to the doctor, right? I mean, there's different viewpoints. I say go to the doctor, right? I think modern medicine is a miracle from God. It's his grace provided to his people, okay? So I'm not saying don't go, but I'm saying when you get that diagnosis, you got that health crisis, do you actually pray to God, trusting God to do something about it? And, and, and when I say to do something about it, it doesn't mean that he is obligated to heal you or your loved one. Doing something is his choosing. Many of you know, I mean, it's a default story for me if you're new, some of the Edinburgh crew. You know, a year ago, I prayed that God would heal my mom. He did something. He just didn't do that. Well, he healed her perfectly, and he took her home. He did something. Oh, well, you know, God didn't respond. No, no, he actually responded in the best way that, that actually could happen. But do we believe he's going to do something? Yes, there's responsibility that we have to take. But are we living lives fully dependent on God, or do we give him some lip service a couple hours a week and then kind of run the show? Or do we give him, yeah, I, I depend on you in church, maybe even at home, but God, business is business. All right? I mean, you don't know, you don't know that world, God. See, see, Elijah learned from God, and God's in the teaching business, by the way. He teaches his children to trust him, and Elijah was learning total dependence. He could do nothing. And think about it, right? He's drinking from the brook, and God is bringing him bread and meat by ravens. I mean, ravens are nasty birds, right? They eat their young. This is God. He has the entire animal kingdom at his disposal. Bald eagle, parrot. Toucan, blue macaw. I, I don't. There's a lot of options. You know, it'd be like God saying to one of us, "I want you to go camp out on the banks of the Rio Grande." Now you're not going to drink that water, but you're going to go camp out on the banks of the Rio Grande, and I'm going to bring you bread and meat. And your first day of obedience on the banks of the Rio Grande, you see some Rio Grande Valley grackle come flying your way with a ribeye in its you know claws. Like, God, I, I know there are green parrots all up and down 2nd Street. You got to send me a grackle? But here's the point, beloved. Check this out. You see, sometimes the messenger of God is not the messenger of our choosing. It doesn't mean that the message is not the message of God's choosing. It doesn't mean that what, what's being delivered is, is not exactly what we need. It's like a story. There's a single mom. She's got three kids, works three jobs, lives in a small apartment. She's just struggling to make ends meet. But she's a faithful believer. And every day she gets on her knees and she, she, she thanks God for what little she has. She worships. She, she, makes, she, she prays for the things she needs. And it's a small apartment, thin walls, and the apartment next to her is an atheist. And he just goes crazy every night and he hears this woman on her knees praying to God. Most mornings they would intersect paths, walking out of their apartments, and he would say, you've got a pipe down woman, you're praying and worshiping, and you're talking to a God who's not there, and I don't want to hear it. Well, one month there happens to be more month than money for this single mom, right? You know, this, those months, there's, just, there's more months than money. So she, she's there, down to that last week, she needs some groceries, she doesn't have any money, she gets on her knees, and she, she just starts worshiping, God, you know what I need. And Father, God, if you're, if you're not, not going to provide, then, then let me know what I need to learn. And the God, I know you're capable to do all things. I'm asking if you would provide a way for me and my kids to eat. And she's just, and that guy's just going crazy. He hears it. So the next morning he wakes up early, he goes down to the grocery store, buys a cart full of groceries, puts it in bags, sets it outside of her apartment door and hides around the corner. Next morning, she wakes up, she walks out, opens the door, sees this stack of bags of groceries. She gets on her knee. She is weeping. God, you're so faithful. You've provided, and, and you're so good, and you're so gracious. And that guy jumps out from around the corner. He says, no, your God didn't provide. I told you he's not real. I went to the store, and I bought the groceries. I provided. And she starts to worship all the more. She says, God, not only did you provide, you made the devil pay for it. <laughs> The messenger isn't always the messenger of our choosing, right? <laughs> but 
the point is there. Beloved, I know this is like a churchy question, but I, but I ask you very pointedly, what's your dependence on God actually look like? How much credibility does he have with you? You trust your ability to get out of things? Let me, let me tell you, I, I'm an extremely type A person. I mean, I got the 30-day plan, the three-hour plan, the three-year plan, and the 30-year plan. It drives my wife crazy. I mean, I, I got it for the church, for my home, my marriage, my kids. My, my oldest son's about to be 12. Literally the other day, my wife and I are driving. I'm like, what kind of car are we going to get Noah? Are, are we going to get him a car? And she's like, he, can, can he be 12 and 13? You know, that, that's just me, okay? I think about it with, with the church. I'm, I'm always out there. So let me be very transparent with you. This is, this is what I do. I, I say, God, what's the five-year plan for BT? What's the five-year plan for me and Christy? And, and I genuinely want his plan. I don't want it to be my plan. I know how that goes. So, God, what's the five-year plan? Give me your plan, and then give me a toolbox with all your tools. I don't want my tools. I want your tools. But this is how it sounds pretty good, right? This is how I want it to work. I want to say, God, give me the five-year plan. Give me the five-year tools, and then give me the toolbox. And let me charge the mountain. I'll check in as needed. It sounds good. If we're not careful, our culture even applauds that. It's just antithetical to how God operates. Sounds morbid. I can't tell you the number of times I've had God tell me time and Chris, you are not promised tomorrow. What are you talking about five years? I'm not saying there's not a, a wisdom principle in preparing and saving. I'm, not, I'm saying trying to control things. You know what God does because he's gracious with this knucklehead? I ask, you know, he says, how about this? Here's a plan for today. And here's some tools for today. But you know what God does? He says, Chris, here's a plan for today, and here's some tools for today, and you can grab onto that toolbox, but I'm not letting go of it because it's my toolbox. I'll, I will let you have a hand on it, but when my hand comes off, it's not my tools, it's yours, and it doesn't work. And so I, I want God's plan. I want God's ways. I just wa want to know how it's all going to work. It's like the nation of Israel when they were wandering after they left Egypt. And God says, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to bring some manna. It's going to rain manna, this, this food. And you can stuff yourself silly every day. I mean, don't even worry about it. Like obesity, you know, you just don't even worry about that stuff. Gluttony, it's gone. Stuff yourself. Get full. Just don't save any for tomorrow because guess what? Tomorrow I'll bring some more. That's what God told the Israelites. So they stuffed themselves, but then they did what we still do if we're honest. They got to the end of the day. They said, well, what if God doesn't bring any more? Even though he said he was going to. What if he forgets or what if he gets angry? What, you know, what, when, what, what if Omar did something and God didn't like it and I happened to be next to Omar and I don't get the reign of man? You know? So let me stash a little in the, in the jacket. The next morning, what was stashed was spoiled. Why? Because God wants us to trust him daily. His mercy is new every morning. His provision is there. It is not total dependence when you check in with God when you think you need him. Beloved, that is pride at its worst. We run to God in times of crisis. It is pride that prevents it. You know, in, in 20 years of working in churches... I've seen benevolence ministry. I'm thankful that we do benevolence ministry at BT. We help people in need in our community, in our congregation. And time and time again, I, I could tell you uh, stories of when a need was presented and, and, and the churches that I was at, if we could, we tried to meet it or get halfway there. But so many times this need was presented that it was a financial emergency. It is a mountain of a problem, but the truth is, if there wouldn't have been pride when that was a molehill of a problem, it would have been easier to fix. You can't pay this month's light bill, but I'm not going gonna, I'm I'm to ask for help. I, I, I remember early in marriage when I needed financial help, I didn't want to call dad to help me out. So what happened? I called him when he had to help me out. And so people bring a light bill, and it's, you know, it's $100, and they can't pay it, and I know that it's humbling. But instead of asking for help, and I believe pride is the sword, instead of asking for help, six months later when the light bill is $700 with a disconnect fee, and there's no one, let, depending on God is not waiting till everything blows up in our face. It's trusting him every day to be enough. And he is teaching Elijah that he's not just all he has, he is actually all he needs. It's total dependence.
You know, there's probably some of us, and the truth is, you've had some things that you find security in stripped away. Maybe it's a job, career change. You've had some things you you found joy in taken from you because, candidly, maybe it needed to be taken. It was some type of sinful addiction. You know what? You know why God takes those things? Not because He's some cosmic killjoy up in the sky, throwing lightning bolts. Because I, I say it all the time. It's Adrian Rogers' famous quote: "Because God wants for us what we would want for us if, if we had the sense to want it." And we settle for addictions, and we settle for halfway satisfaction and God says I have life to the fullest you just got to let me take this stuff from you total dependence and the last stage of character building for Elijah is unconditional obedience he's been taken to the brook he's been alone he's been forced to depend on God and then starting in verse 7 I'm sorry then uh, starting in verse 8 starting in verse 8 then the word of the Lord came to him And said, get up and go to Zarephath that belongs to Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a woman who is a widow to provide for you there. But actually, let let me read verse 7 because it says, after a while, right, after a while, the wadi dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So God says to him, hey, you need to get up. you You need to get out of Dodge. It's time to go somewhere else. Head over to Zarephath. You'll find a widow there. Now imagine Elijah, like Elijah's been living at the brook for, what says, after a while. He, I mean, I don't know, he's named the ravens by now, right? He, he, he's learned how to communicate, I don't know, like he's got a little thing going. It's him, it's God, it's the brook, it's the ravens, it's good. But now it's time for him to go somewhere else. And I don't think it's an oversight to point out that, that the transition starts with verse 7, where God tells us the brook dried up. I wonder if the brook was still flowing and the ravens were still coming if if Elijah would have left. I I don't know. But we start with verse 7, that the brook dried up. And God says, now go to Zarephath, the territory of Zidon, and find a widow there that I've appointed for you to go to. I don't know, maybe Elijah's like, God, we got a good thing going. Or how about this, God, what did I do wrong? You ever do that? God, what did I do wrong? Where did I fail you? What did I mess up? What did I miss? You know, hear me, beloved, sometimes God allows the brooks in our lives to dry up because he wants to get us from where we are to where we're supposed to be. Elijah had somewhere to be for God's glory, and it wasn't at the brook anymore. He had a widow to meet. He he had a son to raise from the dead, the first raising of the dead in Scripture. But how did he get there? How did he connect the dots? Because he had trusted God in isolation. He had totally depended on God. And now he could unconditionally obey God. Because the text says God said, go to Zarephath. And it says, and he went. And he gets there, right? He meets the widow. Says, hey, you know, we read the text and we think that it's like he walked from, you know, BT to 23rd Street. Where he was... To Zarephath, the territory of Sidon, is about a 100-mile journey in a drought with no water. <laughs> so he shows up. He's like, could I get a cup of water? <laughs> Brother's been traveling. And could I, get a, could I get some bread? Now, now the text tells us that he and God had already had the conversation. He knew what was going on. He says, so, so could, I get, could I get a cake maybe? And the widow says to him, look, I got some water, but I can't do that for you. I got these few sticks. I'm making a fire. I'm making a, I'm making a cake. My son and I are going to eat it. We're going to die. There's no flour and oil. Here's the thing that I'm getting at, beloved. When God calls you to unconditional obedience, there will always be other voices talking to you. Which one will you listen to, though? See, he shows up at the widow's house, and the widow, he says, I need you to make me a cake. And the widow says, I can't do it. But God said he wouldn't not do it. You catch that? The widow, she's looking at a real situation. She's got this much flour and this much oil. She's like, I I can't do it. But he had heard the word of the Lord say, I will provide. Beloved, I wonder how many times God, God gives us a word. He gives us the promise of scripture. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And things get bad because it's a broken world. And when things get bad, we think he's forgotten, so we got to fix it. And we hear other voices, you got to do this, you got to take, you got to, And I wonder how many times we listen to the other voices that say that they can't and won't when there's the voice of God who says he can and he will. It was unconditional obedience. She says, she says, I can't do it. He says, look, do what you want, but make me a cake first. Because that flour and oil, it ain't going to run out. 
And then it says yet again, he stayed there for a while. And they kept baking cakes, man. They had those like cake boss. I mean, they're. <laughs> Until one day the sun dies, right? Beloved, understand this. Sometimes unconditional obedience still results in unexpected consequences. Elijah's got God, what happened, right? It's a doubt. But he presses through it. He says, God, what happened? Then he throws himself over the boy and says, God, I know you can. Would you bring life back to this boy? How could he have the faith to do that because he was obedient, because he was dependent? He gets to experience the the work of God in his life, but it wouldn't have happened if he hadn't allowed the process of preparation to take its course. Beloved, I am encouraging you, and I pray for myself that we would not be a people who despise the process of preparation. We're going to talk about this concept in a few weeks. We love to claim the payoff of the promises of God. We just don't love to walk the process to get there. You know, this past week, my wife and I, we introduced our kids to the single greatest martial arts movie in the history of cinematic theater, the original Karate Kid, 1984. Yeah, that's right. It takes real skill, Louis, to bring the Karate Kid into a sermon. Anyways. Here's the deal. Maybe you haven't seen it. Go check it out. Thank me next week. In the movie Karate Kid, I'll wrap up with this. In the movie Karate Kid, there's this this family. It's a mom, single mom, husband passed away, and a son. They moved to California from New Jersey. It's Daniel LaRusso, right? They move to California. Daniel is getting bullied. He meets the apartment uh, maintenance man, Mr. Miyagi, who happens to also be a karate master, right? And he, he, he begs Mr. Miyagi, teach me karate. And so... Reluctantly, Mr. Miyagi agrees, and they start the lessons, and Mr. Miyagi takes Daniel to his house, and he says, all right, I want you to, lesson number one, paint the fence. And Daniel's like, what, paint the fence? I want to punch somebody. No, no, paint the fence. So in the movie, you see Daniel just kind of haphazardly, and he says, no, no, Daniel, son, like this. You go, bah, bah, you know, he teaches him these paint strokes. So he paints the whole fence. He says, all right, now, te- now I did it. Teach me how to punch. He said, no, no, now, now you, need to go, you need to go wax the car. I don't know how an apartment maintenance man has a fleet of cars, but he did. <laughs> he says, go wax the car. And so Daniel's like, you know, happy. He said, no, no, no. You wax on and you wax off. So he, he waxes all the cars. He says, now scrub the floor. And he's scrubbing the floor. He says, no, no, like this. And so finally Daniel's had enough. He's like, this is nonsense. You don't even know karate. You're just making me do all your work. <laughs> and then this awesome moment. Mr. Miyagi just unloads. He is punching and kicking. He's just throwing everything at Daniel. What does Daniel start doing, man? He's painting the fence. Wow! Wax on and wax off. (laughs) And he, he blocks everything. And then you see it in his eyes. It clicks that all of that stuff he despised was the process needed to prepare him to, to go to the All Valley Karate Tournament. Well, beloved, I don't know if you know karate or not, but I know probably most of us, if not all of us, are in a process of preparation. And if you're anything like me, we tend to despise it. But God has not forgotten you. He has great things for you. And your eyes won't be developed enough to see the great things if you don't trust them through the process of preparation, depending upon him and being obedient completely to him. And so the question is, what are you going to do about it? Our ministers are going to come forward right now. And I believe a lot of us probably have a next step. Beloved, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Yeah, I do. What's your dependence look like? There's some of us, we need to take some steps of obedience. Maybe you need to get baptized. We had two baptisms at 9 a.m. It doesn't make you saved. It just tells people you are saved. But it is a step of obedience. Maybe you need to kind of quit playing church and get connected. It doesn't have to be this one. Does does your life reflect the dependence you may say you have on God? What do you need to be obedient towards? There's probably some men and some women, there's there's some husbands and wives you need to grab hands, you need to come hit this altar. And you you feel like you're at a crossroads and you're not sure you're going to get through it. Don't listen to the lie of droughts and doubts. Believe the destiny of God in your life. He has brought you together in covenant marriage. He will keep you together. 
You got those sin struggles. You got that, 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 that issue with the internet, that, that, that addiction, that substance, the alcohol. Would you be willing to bring it into the light so you can walk in obedience? Because when you walk in obedience, your eyes are open to all that God has for you. And maybe there's someone in here, someone in overflow. And the truth is what you need is you need the saving grace of Jesus applied to your life for the very first time. And you don't need to trust religion. And you don't need to trust your good works. Today you need to trust Jesus and receive the gift of life from him. And your destiny will forever be altered. And if you, don't, you, you think that's for you, but you don't know what it means, it doesn't make sense, that's okay. Just come forward. These men and women, all you got to say is, I, I want to know Jesus. That's all you, if you know how to say that, they'll know how to get you the rest of the way. So I'm going to ask you to stand. And as the Lord leads and as we worship and ask him to, to move among us, I'm going to ask you to respond as he leads. Father, this time is yours. Would you move in us and through us, God? Would you bring clarity of mind? Would you take us to the next steps? Would you allow us today to choose obedience and surrender to you for your glory? It's in Jesus' name. Amen.